Previously on Tomorrow's News. Richard, who even is your dad? Oh no, hi boss. Boss? Hi babe. Babe? Hi dad. Dad? I take my eye off the wheel down here for five weeks, and now I'm getting reports of nuclear strikes, possessed correspondents, a talking alien, tens of millions of pounds blown. What the hell are you doing all down here? And what the hell is Tomorrow's News? Well, I said what in the bloody hell is tomorrow's news? It's a news show? How could it be a news show? Your last story was about nuking Kent. Have you seen Kent? Why would anybody nuke Kent? What are you going to do? Put the Daily Mail out of business? Well, is anybody going to give me an explanation or what? It, it is a news show, sir. It's it just kind of a fake news show. Oh, oh, I see. Who are we working for? Conservatives? Labour? Oh, please tell me it's not the Green Party. Um, well, we don't work for anybody. It's more of a satirical comedy programme to make fun of everybody equally. Oh, so now we're communists? Richard, what on earth have you let happen here? This is meant to be a news station with real news. I gave you a job down here using my vast executive privilege, and this is how you repay my hard work? What is all this nonsense about the sports? You're awful at sports! Well, Dad, is it alright I call you that? Okay. Maybe just father. We just wanted to do something different for a change. To have a bit of fun. Wait, hang on a second. So, you're the studio boss? Yes, this is my station. And Richard's your son? This is what the paternity test said. And you're divorcing Olivia? <laughs> In fairness, they were only married for a month. <laughs> Quiet! The next one of you who interrupts me. Better be prepared to have a chair thrown at them. But, sir, we're making such a good show. What? You nearly hit me. That's blatant workplace abuse. Father, you can't throw a chair at someone. Yes, I can. I put it in their contracts. It's true. Don't any of you read them? Guys, guys, the door's unlocked. We're, we're free. Finally, I can see my wife again. Who the hell are these people? Oh, That's the writer's... Room. Good God. What are your names? Archie. Andy. Claudia. Rohan. <laughs> Emily. Sam, 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 Sam. Jonathan. Genevieve. Jake. Mm, Jasper. What are you feeding them? Free school meals? Oh, they look like that anyway. God! Richard, I have had enough of this nonsense. And you're going to sort it out. I want you to get a real new show ready in the next few minutes, or so help me, I will use my contractual right to throw you out of that window. Yes, father. And you too. I assume you're the main anchors of the show? Yes. Get on the air and start doing an introduction for the actual news. And make it sound good. None of this bickering husband and wife rubbish I heard last time. And what would your lordship like it called? That would only be offensive if I wasn't actually a lord. I don't know. You're meant to be the clever ones. Make something up. Hello and welcome to today's news. The news today, today. I'm Elizabeth Longstaff. And I'm Simon Smyman. Unfortunately, listeners, we have a correction to make. In the interest of now being an actual news show, we want to correct the last five episodes, all of which have been a mockery of the real news. Nothing we have said was true, besides the time that it was. We hope you can forgive us. Welcome to the first broadcast without any satire. In today's headlines... The government has released their 2021 spring budget. We have an in-depth discussion on its purpose and the power struggle behind the scenes. The Scottish First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, is facing calls to resign over claims she broke the ministerial code regarding the trial of her predecessor, Alex Salmond. The Duchess of Sussex, Meghan Markle, has been accused of bullying. And the former French President, Nicolas Sarkozy, has been sentenced to three years in prison on corruption charges. Our first item tonight is the 2021 spring budget, unveiled by Chancellor Rishi Sunak on Wednesday in the Commons. Joining us now is Winona Johnson for an in-depth look at what the budget itself means for the government and Conservative Party. 
Winona, can I start just by asking what the principal goals of the budget are? Well, the budget itself is designed both to pursue the economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic, while also uniting the distinct groups of voters united by the Conservatives in 2019. The government is aiming to ensure that they fulfil their obligations to level up the North while reconciling higher spending and taxation with their more traditional southern and rural constituencies of support. Certainly the promises of higher spending do suggest a desire to fulfil part of that agenda. But the language that Rishi Sunak used of the need for sustainable public finances in future does suggest that the government is still thinking in terms which were used to justify austerity only 10 years ago. Why has the Chancellor gone with this rhetoric? Well, the language deployed by the Chancellor is likely part of a bid for future leadership of the Conservative Party. While his stonks is nowhere near as high as it was before Eat Out to Help Out, the Chancellor has still come out of the pandemic with a good reputation, with a net popularity score on YouGov of plus 13% compared to Boris Johnson's negative 12%. The focus on sound finance is likely part of Sunak's strategy to appear as a more balanced but no less ambitious set of hands than the Prime Minister himself and increases popularity amongst the bulk of the Conservative supporters in the South. Some economists have criticised this language, however. The BBC have recently been encouraged not to compare the national economy with household metaphors, for example, with others asking why the government is increasing taxes during a recession when interest rates are even below inflation. Why then, with the cost of borrowing so low, is the government refusing to more comprehensively invest with this budget? Well, what the government is doing here is staking its own claim to the language of fiscal responsibility. I think something that's rather telling is that Labour have used this language of responsibility as well, but in order to argue for increased spending and reduced taxation to accelerate out of the recession. The government's language of taking back control and Britain's managing its own affairs has lent weight to the idea that imperceptible forces, be that the invisible hand of the market or the EU, need state correctives to operate properly. How this translates into government policy is not yet clear, but it is fair to say that this budget may well be the opening salvo in a wider debate about how the economy should operate. Winona Johnson, thank you. Now over to Richard Dick for the sports. I'm sorry, guys. I really didn't know it was in your contracts he could throw chairs at you. Apparently he put it in everybody's contract. He even put it in his prenup. At least we had some fun. We had a good ride for five episodes, didn't we? Yeah. It was a nice change from the real stuff. I suppose it had to come tumbling down sooner or later, though. It was rather pointless. The real news is actually useful. Well, I wouldn't say that, really. The real news is useless on a normal day. It just makes you depressed and scared. I mean, it's good to be informed, but at some point you have got to say, this is enough, and go listen to something blatantly stupid. But you guys write the news. Shouldn't you be more into it? <laughs> There's a difference between paying the bills and enjoying your job, and it's about as clear as the difference between Jeremy Corbyn and Enoch Powell. And it's not that we don't believe in the news as a force for good. Of course we do. We were just a bit sick of it. I remember when I was sick of horse riding at Eton. Some good old useless purchasing of land really cheered me up. Um, I'd say it's a bit different. What we wrote wasn't useless. It might have been pure nonsense. But I'll let your father throw me out that window again before I call it useless. Oh, don't be absurd. This is only the first floor window. He's a strict second floor type of guy. And come on, free speech champion. You're saying that wasn't useless. Well, not really. At the very least, it's saying something about free speech and how we choose to uphold it. At the most, it's quite funny. And somewhere in between, it's an escape from reality. Maybe some listeners tuned in expecting the news and to hear all the humbug and misery. Maybe they heard our little bit of satire and thought it was funny. That's something. You know, people are always rambling about this. What's the meaning of satire, the purpose of comedy? Well, what's the point of racist wind? A depressed talking alien, the reanimated corpse of Princess Diana, adding the word to after everything? I don't know. And maybe that's okay. Maybe it just, for whatever reason, makes us laugh. Maybe. Oh, oh, apologies. I stopped paying attention when you tried getting deep. It was quite nice not to have to talk about actual sports. And flying that woman out from America was really funny. You mean she wasn't an actress? (laughs) No! She was the real head of the PGA. God, was she mad at me. And you know, 
there's enough misery around these days. So what if we decided to make it all up? I'd do it again if I had to. All right. The world doesn't need another miserable, boring old news show. It needs something to laugh at. Would you really do it again? Without a doubt. Well, I'd have some doubts, but I'd still do it. All right, everyone. Get- Richard! You're meant to be doing the sports. All I can hear is you blabbering with these nitwits. Oh, uh, it was just in that storage cupboard over there. I swear I could hear Rishi Sunak threatening to raise taxes. Oh, no, he won't. Where is he? In here? Richard. Sorry, Dad. This is too important. Get the scripts ready. I'm going to go tell everybody. You know what, Liz? I'm starting to think Durham weren't all that. <gasps> no. Really? No, I mean it. He's, he's rude and, uh, and uncaring. And I mean, and he threw that chair at you. And... Yes, I'd say that was quite a considerable strike on his character. Maybe I don't need a man. Maybe I don't need to be married at all. Maybe maybe I can just live my life with with freedom and, 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 and liberty and and do whatever the hell I want with it. And maybe that's okay. Maybe maybe that's all right. Maybe maybe I don't need to hate myself. Whoa, Liz, is this character development? Richard, aren't you meant to be doing the sports? Screw the sports. We're doing tomorrow's news. What about your father? I locked him in a storage cupboard. We can't end tomorrow's news like this, you guys. We had something so stupid and beautiful. Let's go out with a bang. Oh, sod it, I'm in. I've already applied to work at the BBC anyway. Babes, me too. Whoa, 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 whoa. You guys have applied for other jobs. Olivia, get the gang back together. Phone Maxwell and Meredith and tell them to come back from the estate. Tell Wen to be able to stop pretending he's possessed by a big cow. Order Skylar to open the BBC weather app and tell us what it says. Drag Winona back from her spa day with Carrie Simmons. And get Keith back in the ads booth. All right, on it. Come on, come on. We need to start tomorrow's news. Hello and welcome to Tomorrow's News. The news tomorrow, today. I'm Elizabeth Longstaff. And I'm Simon Smyman. Unfortunately, listeners, we have another correction to make. Approximately five minutes ago, we suffered from a severe lapse of artistic integrity and began to report real news. We here at Swen News hope to stick to our convictions in reporting the most absurd and incorrect journalism possible. We apologise for this lack of integrity and promise, truly that we will forever and always be Tomorrow's Tomorrow's News. In today's headlines, climate change, should we care? We catch up with the newly rebranded Ulster Vegetarian Force. Shocking developments as Jesus Christ has been found in Russia. And the iconic footballer, television host and crisps magnate Larry Ginnaker has been arrested for murder. But first, it's time for an exclusive interview with Swen News' own climate change specialist, Carl Carbon. Right. Climate change. Everyone's talking about it, but should we care? That's a very political question, Mr. Smyman. I don't think I'm qualified to answer that. What do you mean it's political? It just is. Sorry, but our sponsors don't pay us to spout misleading radical rhetoric. What do you do with your day, then? Why are you even here? Tell me, Carl. Tell me. Why am I here? You tell me. (sighs) Look, can you just give me an answer? Climate change. Should. We. Care. Well... Rationally and intellectually, I suppose you could say yes. Nobody's been pro-apocalypse since the 40s. Are you sure? Elizabeth, maybe we should have found someone pro-apocalypse for balance. But who cares about rationality and intellectualism? Nobody likes to know it all. If we really cared about climate change, we'd all stop flying, we'd stop eating meat, we'd stop using plastic, we'd stop driving cars, and we'd completely de-industrialise the entire planet. But I like plastic. All the best things are plastic. So do I. And I love flying to foreign destinations. Me too. And I adore my Range Rover. I... And steak is just... But you're not pro-apocalypse, are you, Simon? <clears throat> and now it's time for the other news with Olivia Stiffbottom. Hello! Once again, I am your one and only leading lady, Olivia Stiffbottom. Following on from the rebranding of the British Union of Fascists as the British Union of Fun, 
The Ulster Volunteer Force, legendary defenders of our precious union who did nothing wrong during the Troubles, no sir, thank you, has taken a step to rebrand as the Ulster Vegetarian Force to appeal to a younger demographic. Here to tell us more is the new vegetarian chief, Kean English. Kean, why has this move occurred now? Well, to be honest with you, vegetarianism has always been a key feature of our ideology. In truth, we abhor violence of any kind. Except, of course, against those Fenian b****. We were also influenced by a number of our vegetarian idols, such as Sheep and St Anthony. I see, I see. And, um, is it also helping you gain new members? Aye, it is, so it is. Since we've made that change, we've had a serious uptake of members since this began. This new policy has clearly struck a chord with the youth of Northern Ireland, who clearly share our interests in preserving the lives of animals and beating up Catholics. And does this have any relation to the newly founded Irish Red Meat Army, who were red and therefore the baddies? Well, what we see there is a clear link between Irish nationalism and the barbarism that is eating meat. These nationalists clearly know no limits to their depravity, and we have no choice but to oppose them, be it through protests, petitions, or secret service-funded paramilitary activity. Well, as ever, we here on tomorrow's news have to be unbiased, but I think I speak for all of us here when I say keep up the good work and uh, give those nationalists a good kick in. All right, uh, now, Keith, what are you doing in here? Hello, Olivia. You advertising with me. Read this. What the hell is this? Have we got to make an ad for ourselves on our own show? Because if things fall through, then very soon we won't have our own show. You'll be forced back onto the streets while I'll have to go back to shining shoes and writing columns for the Sunday Express, alright? Right, whatever, just... Just make it quick, right? Well, it's almost five o'clock. I've got to hand off my divorce papers. Alright, ready? Three, two, one. Struggling with a constant onslaught of real news clogging up your airwaves? Hate having to listen to events that actually happened? Want a break from reality? Then maybe you need a local fake news team. And that's why we here at Tomorrow's News are offering our services to whoever will take them. We know what you're thinking. Tomorrow's News. I thought that was yesterday's news. But it is not. Tomorrow's news is not even today's news, since today's news quickly becomes yesterday's news. Rather, tomorrow's news is tomorrow's news, which is gonna be today's news, but since tomorrow's news is tomorrow's news, that's two tomorrow's newses. So really, it's the day after tomorrow's news. The script doesn't make any sense. Shut up! Yes, it does. Many news teams claim to report the events as they happen. But we here at Tomorrow's News report the events before they happen. At least, how it would happen if they were funny. In fact, we're so ahead of the curve that none of the stories that we've reported have yet to happen. Besides the one that really did. We are thus offering our services to you for just £4.55 an hour or best offer. What? Shouldn't we be negotiating from a position of strength? That is a position of strength. Keep reading. So hire the Tomorrow's News team today for all your four journalistic needs. And cut! Perfect! I'm going to send this to the BBC. And now it's me, Skylar Flurry, with the weather. I'm currently doing something a lot of people will be doing this morning. I'm losing my job. Why? Well, in light of some recent controversies, the government have announced they will be permanently cancelling the weather, taking with it the jobs of hundreds of hard-working weather reporters. The weather has been cancelled a number of times on social media, most recently due to the previously reported racist wind. And last week, the Environmental Secretary, Georgie Steen, announced the government would be officially discontinuing the geographical phenomenon. The weather has contributed a huge amount to all of our lives. However, it has become increasingly clear to us that it is no longer fit for purpose. This is a Conservative government committed to levelling up those regions left behind by previous governments, which means working hard on the issues they care about. Money... Money, posh people's money, and money. Plans are being made over the next month to gradually disconnect the weather from its main frame, with the government aiming for a completely blank sky by April. The Tories say this decision to ax the project comes as part of a series of cuts they're making to public services in order to balance the books after the COVID-19 pandemic. Joining me to discuss the end of the weather is political editor Winona Johnson. <laughs> Winona? Are you on the line? 
Oh, sorry. <clears throat> Hello, I am Winona Johnson, not reporting live from my nepotistic spa day with Carrie Simmons. Not reporting live from your nepotistic spa day with Carrie Simmons? Yes, I'm definitely not doing that. How can you be so frivolous about this when I'm losing my job because of her? Yes, yes, it is very sad, but we all have to pull together. This is ridiculous. You're a political journalist. It's your job to hold power to account, not jump into bed and get hot waxes together. Skylar, what part of my reporting over the past five weeks makes you think I am in any way interested in being impartial or professional? I am a political editor, which means I love gossip, speculating about what people with more power and influence than me are thinking, and have no critical thought capacities whatsoever. What are you moaning about anyway? All you do is read the BBC weather app. What? Oh no, you didn't get the chief of staff fired. Oh, Carrie, you're such a girl boss. We know not. <clears throat> yes, yes. It's very sad that you're losing your job, and I'm sure the government did all that it could to stop this happening, but ultimately has no choice in spite of wielding absolute power and being able to do literally whatever it wants. Is that what you want to hear? You. To commoderate the unparalleled contribution it has made to all of our lives, a week-long schedule of special weather events has been announced to see off the controversial climate. Proceedings will kick off with a giant hailstones on Monday, followed by the hottest and coldest days on record on Tuesday and Wednesday, respectively. There will be a union jack-shaped balls of lightning on Thursday, procession of child-friendly mini tornadoes on Friday, and the celebrations will end on the Saturday with the first and only UK performance of the Aurora Borealis. After that, expect indefinite periods of constant darkness. So that's it. That's all the weather left. I'm Skylar Flurry, and I'm off to Sweden, where they have free weather. Bye, everyone. Now over to the arts, where the world of acting has been stunned by the loss of four of its brightest stars this week. We now go to our arts correspondent, Meredith Hibbertson, for more. Matteo Parafesi, John Bukowski, Richard Mantle and Raphael Ferguson. The beloved Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles were found dead in their New York sewer three days ago by a pizza delivery boy. They had thick wads of plastic clogged in their throats. The adolescent reptilian actors who played Leonardo, Michelangelo, Donatello and Raphael, respectively, had just signed a new contract which would see them take on the Twilight Vampires inside the Vatican in Turtles Mutant Ninja Twilight. Joining me now to mourn the loss is Master Splinter. Mr Splinter, how does it feel to lose the turtles? I'm devastated. I've known those turtles since they were cartoons, then talking plastic, then cartoons again, then some CG something or other. It's like losing my kids. You sound like you were quite close. We were! What am I going to do without them, eh? They made me so much moolah. All those parties, awards, women. <laughs> Can you reflect on how much the turtles meant to you? Oh, it's been terrible. I mean, they were actual mutant ninja turtles. They had the cure to cancer and their genetics. They meant a great deal to me, they did, Meredith. And the pharmaceutical companies who definitely did not murder him. I'm very sorry for your loss. They're all going down, Meredith. Scooby's off his nuts on crack. Other than the chipmunks got exterminated, the Transformers have been recycled because of their CO2 emissions. It's a tough old world out there for a giant talking rat, Meredith. A tough old world. Sorry, Mr. Splinter. Guys, I said I'd come back for one more episode if I could do some serious arts and culture coverage. And you've got me talking to a big rat. Oh, shut up, Meredith. You've got the easiest job on the show. Easy? I had a career before this. I had status. I wrote for Tatler. <laughs> Who cares about status? But you sound like Maxwell Triple Barrel Surname. That's because we're cousins from the landed gentry, where everybody's related to everyone else. Then what are you complaining about? You've literally had anything and everything you could have ever wanted handed to you on a plate. You've never had to get a real job, which is why you're an arts and culture correspondent. What are you talking about? Being an arts and culture correspondent is hard. I'd like to see you offer in-depth and meaningful analysis on the cultural output of the day. <laughs> that doesn't mean anything. You're just saying warm and fluffy stuff about warm and fluffy things. But what are you actually doing? I don't know, Liz. Back in the good old 19th century, people like me were celebrated. Celebrated! We could lounge around in our pyjamas, get hooked on opium, spaff out some letters and be called a genius. And now look where we are. The left still hates us, and now the right do too. 
What am I supposed to do with myself? Do you have any idea how much self-hatred I and all my landed cousins have for ourselves deep down? I've got all this money, but no talent and no skills and nothing to show for my life besides a short Wikipedia page that I wrote for myself. Wow. That got deep really quickly. Sorry. That was unprofessional. No, I, I'm sorry, Meredith. Being a satirist and punching up to the powerful is, is all well and good, but not if we're making the powerful upset. Thanks, Elizabeth. That means a lot. Maybe tomorrow's news isn't so bad after all. Hey, where can Master Splinter find a Mr. Crack, eh? Hey. Turning and turning in the widening gyre. I'm Maxwell Triple Barrel Surname reporting this week from Russia. A mine in Mr. Yeats's favourite topic, the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's right, I'm speaking out of a tiny village in the centre of Sheragash, where a local man claims that he saw the Son of God return last week and says that he has the evidence to prove it. <laughs> Things may fall apart, but not this reporter's appetite for fine women, fine Russian vodka, and voluptuous stories. Now, you may be asking, Maxwell, you're an incredibly attractive and wealthy reporter with a keen nose for stories and an unwavering commitment to accuracy. Why should you believe this particular man when millions claim to see Jesus every day? Well, I was once like you, dear listener. Ignorance to the truth. After a little digging on this wonderful town, which, wouldn't you know, happens to be Russia's premier alpine sporting location, I grabbed my skis, woke my pilot up from his cot at the foot of my bed, and I was away. I spent a few days sampling the local women to get a flavour of the culture, really get into this man's head what it must have been like to see the Son of God outside his front door. He's here with me now. Yeah, that's right. I saw Jesus, yeah? He was a, a big guy, yeah? Big, uh, yeah, a big long beard. Uh, kind of had these robes coming off him, yeah? You know, proper ethereal, like, uh, defo Jesus. Yeah, you no, know, like, I'd put a, I'd stake anything on it, like, you know, maybe even a tenner. That is fascinating. And you say you have proof. Oh, uh, yeah, that's right. I took some pictures on my phone. Hang on a sec. It's here somewhere. Uh, let me just uh, scroll in. Scroll in. Takes a while, this. Oh, what? Oh, no, you're flipping hell. You're absolutely pulling my legs here. I cannot believe this. Bloody phone can't save the... Urgh! This is outrageous. I, I cannot believe this. Absolutely frustrating. Right, you hang on a sec. Oi! Oi, Trace! Trace, go over here. It's my mate Trace. She saw it as well. Trace! What? Well, you saw him, right? You saw the son of God with me? Oh, big beardy guy, all ethereal robes, coming out the laundrette with a ciggy and a pint of numbers? Yeah, yeah, you know him. You couldn't have missed him. Defo the son of God. Absolutely, definitely. Stake a fiver on it at least. Anyways, now, that wanted poster for him, it did talk about a reward, yeah? You saw a wanted poster for the Son of God. Right over here. Lost God, £50 reward. Mind you, this picture makes him out to have a lot more of a tail than I remember. And I think calling him a cock or poo is a bit harsh. Well, this one's on me, folks. There you have it. Things fall apart, much like tomorrow's news before we're all destroyed in the national media for brazen abuse of journalist integrity, I think I'll stick it out here for a while longer. All good things come to an end, whether it's satirical news shows or the British aristocracy. I'm off for a good spot of skiing. And now we go to the sports with Richard Dick, who I'm told has one of the most exciting headlines of all time. What is it, Richard? Do you want the good news or the news? The good news. Larry Ginniger has signed a new advertising deal with Walkers, in which he must promote Walkers' product with every sentence uttered from his crispy lips. Oh, good for him, I suppose. And what's the news? Larry Ginniger has been arrested for murder. Good Lord. I know. He made the following statement outside the Old Bailey. Earlier today, I was formally charged with the premeditated murder of Shallon Rearer, which came as a great surprise to me. Not dissimilar to the surprise I felt when I learned that a packet of Quavers only has 88 calories. The cause of death was hundreds of crisps individually rammed down the victim's throat. But I reject any accusation that I was to blame. After all, when Walker's Prawn Cocktail Crisps taste this good, 
Isn't it more plausible that the victim rammed them down his own throat? I'll be pleading not guilty. The only thing I'm guilty of is not picking up a bag of new flaming hot giant wadsits available now from all shops with food in them. And now, here's a statement made by the prosecution, who appear to have an advertising deal of their own. We are dealing here with nothing less than first degree murder, and McCoy's deal with nothing less than first degree crisps, we will be pushing for the strongest possible sentence. Stronger even than the flavour of McCoy's salt and vinegar. McCoy's flavour is weak! Weak like your evidence! Gosh, that all sounds rather messy. Who knew crisps could cause so much drama? I don't even like crisps. Or sports, for that matter. Yes, I was wondering why your father gave you the sports brief. Because he thought it would be easy. Let's face it, does anybody really care about sports? I don't. There we are, then. Yes, lots of people say they do, but lots of people say lots of things, like how much they enjoy Tesco meal deals or living in a democracy. It's just a society-wide Stockholm Syndrome. I must say, Richard, that's the most insightful comment you've ever made on this show. Really? No. What the hell is wrong with you? Of course lots of people like sports. But it's just balls! It's people kicking balls! How is that in any way enjoyable? People like to watch people kick balls into nets. It's entertaining. And here I am, stuck talking about it. I wanted so much more from my life. You're telling me. I wanted to play You know, when I was a little boy, I wanted to be an actor. Oh... But father wouldn't let me. Said I had to go into broadcast radio. Continue the legacy of the dicks. Well, you do have a lovely and soothing voice. Thanks, Simon. That means a lot. How about we get a drink after all this? Yeah, I'd like that. <coughs> um, uh, are we still live? Guess what? Haha, <laughs> it's me, Wensley Dale Bankpuss, domestic correspondent, back again. What? Wensley Dale? I thought you were possessed by a big cow. It's a fake news show, Simon. I can do literally whatever I want. Right. And where exactly are you this week, Wensleydale? I'm here with the doe-eyed students at the University of Oxbridge, eagerly awaiting a big announcement. Ooh, and what might that be? Are you ready, kids? Yay! Well, guess what? Tuition fees are going down. Yay! Psych! They're going up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, those darned kids. Too right. As we all know, young people are barely vulnerable to coronavirus. And if they are, who cares? They're not voting for the government anyway. As such, policymakers at the Department of Education have determined that the fee will rise to £20,000 per term and converted Student Finance England into a hedge fund. It's an entirely reasonable move. When you put it like that, this is a move which sounds entirely reasonable. Oh yes, it's hard-hitting investigative reportage like this that really butters my crumpets. Beats being possessed by a big cow, I'll tell you that, Simon. Were you really possessed by that big cow, or were you just acting? Me? Acting? No. You know me, Simon. I'm a 100% legitimate and serious journalist. Oh, of course you are. And what's next for Wensleydale? Well, given the imminent collapse of my career, I'm quite excited to take a break for a while, eat some cheese, put on some tunes, and just kick back. As you know, Simon, I love doing things considered hip and cool. And because I like any self-awareness whatsoever, I feel no qualms about my involvement in a vociferously fake news show. Now, if you'll excuse me, I think these students are about to literally eat me alive. This is Wensleydale Bagpuss, signing off. And that's it from us. I'm Elizabeth Longstaff. And I'm Simon Smyman. We here at Swen News wish you a happy rest of your life. Hi, boss. Boss? Oh, wait, uh, that was last week's script. Stop, Dad. I won't let you ruin this show. You locked me in a storage cupboard. You're, frankly, quite lucky to still have your credit card, son. Did you hear that? called me son. We won't let you stop us from ending the show with our dignity, no matter how many chairs you legally throw at us. Well, I think I'd personally stop after two chairs. Listen, I'm not- You raw life piece of scum! For all the weeks that I was married to you, I would have never thought you'd have such indecency to be such a a, 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 a cretinous villain as to end this show by pulling it live on air. You disgust me. And I'm taking the house and the divorce. I am. Just just try and stop me. I'm doing it. Uh, Olivia, listen. I wasn't... That's right. This show is going to end the right way.
not some terrible meta way. You know, when you just wish it would end already, but they continue to massage their egos. I shan't have it. Be quiet! I'm not here to ruin the ending. You're not? No. Look, when I was locked in that storage cupboard, I could hear the show on the speakers. I daren't say it, but the show isn't that bad. It's not great. But it was more interesting than the normal news. Once Keith let me out, I came down here to watch the ending. I'm just going to say it. Good job, Richard. Oh my god. Don't worry, he faints quite a lot. I know. The doctors think he was eating all that caviar instead of baby formula. Anyway, I believe you two have a show to finish. Wait, does this mean we're not cancelled? We can continue with the show? Oh no, you're cancelled. You're a fiscal disaster. All of your advertisements were made up. You spent millions of pounds flying Americans to and from the station to make fun of them. And the network is drowning in libel lawsuits. None of you are ever working again. You know what? I'd still do it all over again. Yeah, me too. So would I. Keith, do you ever leave the ad booth? Why would I leave my bedroom? Three, two, one. What are you doing? Breaking into song to end the show, like all the best comedies do. Oh, this is my moment. For weeks I've been trying to tell you all what I really wanted to be doing with my life. <sighs> to play the accordion. <laughs> Can't really argue with that. <laughs> Once more for old times' sake. You take the lead, co-anchor. You've been listening to Tomorrow's News. I'm Simon Smyman. And I'm Elizabeth Longstaff. From all of us here at Swen News, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for listening. Good morning. been listening to the finale of tomorrow's news tonight's production was directed by jake rose and jasper Cresty hyde produced by vicky chu edited by jake rose with publicity design by jonathan powell written by archie breer jonathan neary emily mcpherson smith james colhane genevieve badia aylin andy bucks claudia vivian rohan sharma jake rose and jasper Cresty hyde starring jemima langdon as elizabeth longstaff saul bailey as simon smyman Kitty Beck as Winona Johnson, Joe Folly as Maxwell Triple Barrel Surname, Barnaby Evans as Wensleydale Bagpuss, Edo Rosen as Keith, Iona Rogan as Olivia Stiffbottom, Gabriel Jones as Richard Dick, Aiste Mizgarite as Skylar Flurry, and Holly Jones as Meredith Hibbertson. This episode also featured the writers as themselves, Louis Davies as Durham Dick, Isaac Allen as Carl Carbon, Neil Seary as Kean English, Nadia Lines as government spokesperson, Ryan Morgan as Russian man, Amy Meyer as Russian woman, Theo Rooney as Larry Ginnicker, and Candice Boudoui as prosecution lawyer. The music you've heard was composed by Thomas Field, and Rainbows was composed by Kevin McLeod, licensed under Creative Commons, with additional sound effects provided by Zapsplat, Freesound, and Soundbible. To everybody who has listened to and supported tomorrow's news, we are eternally grateful. From Jasper, Jake Rose, and Vicky. Thank you, and good morning. Good morning.